Hi everyone, Kevin Pollock here from Prince William County's Historic Preservation Division. I'm standing here in the midst of the Central Passage of Ben Lomond, one of our historic sites here in suburban Manassas. And right now I'm standing right in the middle of our 1861 Civil War Field Hospital exhibit. Today when you come to Ben Lomond, the tour that you'll be given typically focuses on the pre-Civil War and Civil War uh, time period of the history here at Ben Lomond. However, the house being built in 1832 has nearly 200 years of history. And so today what I'm going to share with you is Ben Lomond's connection to an event that took place far away from here, uh, but it took place actually in the 20th century as compared to the 19th century where most of our stories uh, did occur. And again, our setting today is not going to be Ben Lomond uh, per se, but instead it's going to be the Pan American Exposition of 1901 held just north of the city of Buffalo, New York. The Pan American Exposition was really a World's Fair, but it was meant specifically to highlight the progress that the world had made early in the 20th century, the progress specifically that the United States was making at that point under the presidency of William McKinley, and more importantly, it was meant to symbolize and highlight the shared interests of the nations of North, South, and Central America. However, in all reality, it was essentially a World's Fair, and people traveled from all across the globe to Buffalo, New York, to visit the Pan American Exposition. When visitors traveled, they could visit exhibits on agriculture, on electricity. They could see what was at the time a very new piece of technology, an x-ray machine. Visitors could travel on gondolas through canals that had been built through uh, the Pan American Exposition. And uh, visitors could travel on roller coasters, trains that traveled all across uh, this great space. The buildings were made just out of wood and plaster. It was meant to be a very temporary uh, exhibition but again, something that would highlight all of the progress that had been going on, especially in the Western Hemisphere in the late 19th and into the early uh, 20th century. Now, September 5th, 1901, the most distinguished guest came to the Pan American Exposition, and that was President William McKinley. McKinley gave a speech. He toured around the expo uh, quite a bit. And then the next day, September 6th of 1901, uh, McKinley traveled to Niagara Falls to see one of the great wonders of the natural world. Niagara Falls was not only just a great natural site for McKinley and some of his family and friends and his staff to visit, but Niagara Falls was also essential to the exposition's uh, success. At night, visitors could walk throughout the expo and thousands, literally thousands of light bulbs illuminated the entire landscape. It was something that was even captured on video by none other than Thomas Edison that you can still uh, go and see today. It was just a beautiful array of the power of electricity. And this was really the first large display of electricity in all of the United States uh, at this point. And it was all being powered by Niagara Falls. So after visiting Niagara Falls, McKinley uh, made his way back to the Pan American Exposition where he was to have a 10 minute reception, a meet and greet, if you will, with the public. Now this was something that McKinley's staff had tried to talk him out of for a long time coming. Uh, however, McKinley was always somebody that wanted to greet the public. He wanted to meet the people. It was one of his favorite parts of the job. And so a 10-minute reception was set up at the Temple of Music where McKinley would meet, again, for just a short amount of time, just 10 minutes, where McKinley would meet uh, with the public. So lines uh, scattered out the door. The people lined up, deep rows of people uh, to meet the president. And for the first five minutes or so, William McKinley stood there in the middle of the Temple of Music, greeting all of these visitors as they came in. McKinley was an expert politician, and it was said he could shake up to 50 or 60 hands per minute. He had a very expert way of gripping someone's hand with his right hand uh, so as not to be squeezed. And then with his left hand, he would grab them by the arm and sort of guide them along the line so that he could meet 50 to 60 people at a time. Security was tight, though, and there were, as I mentioned earlier, uh, especially by McKinley's staff, there were concerns about the president's safety. However, one of the typical safety concerns or safety rules that was not uh, followed that day because it was so hot is that people typically had to approach the president with their hands empty and open so that they could be, uh, so that the security could see what was in people's hands. However, it was so hot that day Many men and women were carrying handkerchiefs with them. Some were draped over their hands themselves so they could wipe their brows. And ultimately, that rule was not enforced. Seven minutes into the reception, one man approached the president with a handkerchief over his right hand. 
Assuming that he was injured, William McKinley reached out with his left hand to greet this man, and just as their two hands touched, two shots were fired straight into the chest of the president. The man who fired those shots was none other than self-proclaimed anarchist Leon Cholgosh, and immediately after receiving those two wounds to the chest, McKinley initially stumbled forward and then slowly staggered backward into the arms of his staff. They were very quickly able to get McKinley into a chair where McKinley insisted that he was in fact not wounded, though blood could be seen coming out of his abdomen. However, McKinley had enough power to tell the crowd to stop pummeling Cholgosh as chaos gripped the Temple of Music. People began to beat uh, the assassin, but McKinley was able to talk them out of it and get them off of Cholgosh. Uh, Cholgosh was later arrested. Of course, he would be tried for the assassination of McKinley and ultimately would be executed by electric chair uh, for his crimes. However, McKinley had to get out of the uh, Temple of Music very, very quickly, and so an electronically powered ambulance arrived outside the Temple of Music. McKinley was conveyed into the ambulance and driven to the emergency hospital nearby. Now, ironically, Inside the emergency hospital where surgery took place, there was no electricity inside the building. All the electricity at the uh, Pan American Exposition was displayed on the outside of the building. So it was incredibly dark. At this point, doctors are pouring in from all across Buffalo to offer their assistance uh, to McKinley. And one of those doctors to arrive late who was not present with the president at the Temple of Music was none other than uh, Presley Marion Rixey who was the White House physician and the personal physician of the McKinley family. When Rixey arrived, many of the uh, doctors had already started performing operations, but again, because it was so dark, it was very difficult for them to see the wound that McKinley had suffered. And so Rixey's role during all of this was to hold up a medical pan uh, and reflect the only sunlight coming into the room, reflect it onto the wound so doctors could actually see what was going on. The entry and exit wounds were ultimately sewn shut, and the president was conveyed to the Milburn House in Buffalo, where he had been staying during all of that time. Now, just holding a simple medical pan to convey light onto a wounded man's chest might not seem like all that much, but Presley Marion Rixey's story is much deeper uh, than just that. Rixey was born here in Virginia. He was born a little ways south of Manassas in Culpeper in July of 1852, where Rixey and his brothers actually witnessed uh, the American Civil War truly taking place in their backyard. Rixey and his sons, uh, excuse me, his brothers always used to go outside. They would watch cavalry charges back and forth across their backyard until finally their mother forced them uh, to come inside and into safety. In the years after the Civil War, Rixey attended the University of Virginia, as well as the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, where he achieved his medical uh, degree and he became an assistant surgeon in the United States Navy. He only spent a few years at sea, however, before in 1882 being assigned to the Naval uh, Dispensary in Washington, D.C., where he spent most of the rest of his career. However, it was while he was there in Washington that Rixey made the acquaintance of President William McKinley, and McKinley later would ask Rixey to serve as the White House physician to both himself and his wife, Ida, who was very much an invalid and often suffered from seizures, unfortunately. Rixey traveled across the country with William McKinley, especially in McKinley's aftermath tour of the Spanish-American War, when he traveled uh, all across the nation to, again, meet and greet uh, with the public. And so Rixey became a very important piece of McKinley's personal life there at the White House and as president. And as such, once McKinley was conveyed to the Milburn House for his recovery in September of 1901, Rixey was the man that was charged with heading the president's recovery. Every four times or so uh, during the day, personal handwritten dispatches from Rixey went out to newspapers across the country, updating everybody about the president's recovery efforts. It seemed for the first week that McKinley would make a full recovery. However, by the morning of September 13th, things looked grim. McKinley's heart rate began to race uh, and, and heighten more and more, and everybody thought that perhaps this was the end. However, incredibly enough, that very same day, just a few hours later, McKinley made uh, a recovery, and everybody thought, well, now maybe he might turn around uh, and survive. But by the evening of September 13th, things once again began to grow worse for McKinley as gangrene developed in the wound that he had received, and so it was Rixey's uh, misfortune to have to be the one alerting the country that the president was likely to die within the next few hours. Rixey allowed the McKinleys to have one last visit, and then ultimately 
During the night, Rixey himself was personally in the room with the dying McKinley to monitor the president's status. By 9.30 p.m. of September 13th, McKinley lost consciousness. By 11.30 p.m., he went cold. And then at 2.15 on the morning of September 14th, 1901, President William McKinley died from the wounds he received just eight days earlier. The lights were turned out in the parlor of the Milburn House, and one of McKinley's personal secretaries, George Gertelieu, walked outside into the streets to alert the mourners that the president had ultimately died. Now it was Rixey's turn to handle and take care of Ida McKinley. And uh, Rixey personally accompanied McKinley's body and Ida back to Canton, Ohio, where it was ultimately laid to rest. And Rixey, despite still holding the position of White House physician now for President Theodore Roosevelt and his family, uh, Rixey stayed in Canton to make sure that Ida McKinley would recover from the grief that she had just gone through and the tragedy that she had just experienced. After about a month of being in Canton uh, with Mrs. McKinley, Rixey came back to the White House where he served as a, the White House physician for, uh, again, Theodore Roosevelt and his family, though under the condition that uh, from Roosevelt, Rixey could travel back to Canton to be with Mrs. McKinley and take care of her uh, at any moment or any time that he was needed. Rixey served as a member of the White House staff until the end of Theodore Roosevelt's term as President of the United States. And then in 1907, he got possession of this property. Uh, it belonged to his brother, a Democratic uh, congressman by the name of John Franklin Rixey, who uh, would often welcome President Theodore Roosevelt out here to Ben Lomond to hunt on the property, but then also to visit the nearby Civil War battlefields. When John Franklin Rixey died in 1907, the property passed to his brother, Presley Marion Rixey. By that point, Rixey was a rear admiral in the United States Navy. He owned all sorts of different farms and properties uh, here throughout Northern Virginia. And Rixey turned uh, this farm around to become, once again, a successful farming operation. Though it wasn't so much that he was farming crops and animals here, but instead what Rixey was doing was chopping down much of the walnut timber that uh, existed on the property here and selling it to make the farm once again profitable. He owned the farm, uh, Ben Lomond, until 1916, and Rixey ultimately lived until 1928 uh, when he passed away, and today he is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. This is just one of the many stories of Ben Lomond. Uh, and Prince William County that we don't often get to tell on tours, but Presley, Mary, and Rixley obviously played a very important role in one of the most tragic events in all of American history, the assassination of President William McKinley. And so we have this neat, loose connection of his ownership of Ben Lomond to those events that ultimately took place in 1901. If you're interested in learning more about the history of Prince William County, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll find plenty more videos talking about the very diverse and unique history that we have right here in the county.